11th of September 2021 and it is uh, just about uh, 15 hours and 30 minutes of the day. And we're off once again. All of this stuff I expected to come in came in. Or should I say hoped to come in came in. Uh, I've got the battery so I've got my uh, signals on once again. camera's kind of fixed up. Uh, the radio that I was waiting for that uh, allowed me to hear, hear rail traffic uh, and schedules has come in. So all in all, a uh, productive day. We're going to get started on uh, our conversation for today, and this is going to be on Hegel and how Gnosticism feeds into the world of Plum. Because Hegel was before Plum, and Plum kind of, sort of, well, you, the name of his, his discovery, and this is basically the solar panel, Planck is the one who discovered the solar panel. And it was so named because it was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And typically at that time, you only did experiments within accepted parameters. You just simply fiddle around with things and see what happened. Uh, this is what you learn in uh, in most most of your schools. You learn this is the scientific methods. You know, in terms of elementary school, grade school, you know, uh, middle, second, uh, middle, secondary school, like high school. Uh, these are, this is what's taught. The experimentation is not willy-nilly, if you want to put it that way. It's not random. But what happened is, is that Planck did that. He, he went beyond the boundaries and began to understand various different things that, that uh, nature wasn't so predictable. And so what happens is that he takes the Voltarian idea of a, of a godless world uh, operating on its own and turns it back to what Hegel understood, because Hegel was a Gnostic. And this is why this it's, it's so important to understand that that are not Gnosticism is pretty much alive in the world today. And if you want to describe what a Gnostic is, that's your that's your deep state. That's your that's your uh, shadow government. All of your shadow government is Gnostic, and they're not going to come out and tell you this because most of the Gnosticism they believe in are hidden truths. They're, they're designed to be uh, you know only for an elite few. This is why they they have the term Illuminati. It's only for the elite few, the elected few, who are allowed to sort of see these various different understandings. And this is what we see in universities as the weeding out process. That only, we only select the best and the brightest. Uh, and those who can see, those who have the capacity to see beyond what the average person sees. And this is what happens is a lot, a lot of humanism really evolves from the Gnostic sense just simply without God. Matter take the Roman Catholic Church, strip away all the all, all the all the God stuff, the, the Gnostic stuff, and that's what that's what humanism is. Humanism is an evolve is an evolution of both the Catholic and the Protestant. So you can you view the Protestant as the child of Roman Catholicism, and then take. Uh, uh, the humanism as the grandchild of Roman Catholicism. In other words, they're all sitting with, within the family or sphere of the Holy Roman Empire, which is, which is, was, was at its inception. The Holy Roman Empire was indeed Gnostic, even though it had a Christian face. And the thing is that you'll be, if you if understand the history of the church well enough, Again, not through original textbook, not going through and finding some of these sources that are 
unknown and, and they, they can be found it just takes a lot of patience it took me years to sort of put these stuff together it took uh, St. Irenaeus who sort of described how there are a variety of spectrums that it wasn't all one thing uh, that there were you know a number of people who were you know involved and they, they, they cut across multiple groups and this is what this is what produces the you know these people who do these these symbology things on, on masonry and you know and the Illuminati and so on and so forth they go oh look at all the symbols that are in there well they don't understand that it's not all one thing that, that, that they are broken up into thousands of different groups even your unions and guilds are all Masonic. They're all of that, and this is not the proper term. is not Masonic. Masonic is simply the guild that they're in. It's, it's, it's the trade. The proper term is Gnostic. They're all Gnostic. So, this is if you want to really learn about this stuff, you want to sort of start getting your feet wet, and if, if you're doing some of this stuff, don't use the term Mason. Use the term Gnostic. That is the proper term. And the proper search is Gnosis. For the left-hand path of Gnosis, what you want to look up is sex magic. And that will get you into your uh, into that understanding of the left and why they have these so-called uh, parties. Like Pizza Gate, uh, uh, spirit cooking. These are all done at parties, and this is what a masquerade ball would have been. These are all origins have origins within the Gnostic understanding of things. They're all on that side, and particularly they're all on the left. Anything that is physically oriented oriented towards the physical being is a uh, left-hand path it's the right-hand path believes that the uh, typically believes that uh, the human body is nothing more than a husk a shell and that you need to shed this husk in order to be saved in order to have your soul saved uh, the left-hand path dispenses with the soul from a majority of people in other words, the majority of the people, the sheeple, will have no continued life after death. It is only for the illumined few who achieve certain goals, they will have a life after death. They will have, in many ways, achieved immortality. This is the promise. The promise behind everything here is not only fame and wealth here, but it's, at the same time, it is for those who are a lumen, lumen few. ones who will end up with Im immortality. Now the thing is, is that the, the, the Gnostics don't mention what's going to happen in the world beyond. They just mean, oh yeah, you're going to have immortality and it's going to be very nice. Well, not necessarily, because particularly on the left, the left is based on deceit. This is where the god Loki is. Uh, Thor is on the right hand path, sort of. But because they always talk about revenge, and they have this anger thing, you can imagine that anger and revenge will be the central core of where you are. So it's not, you know, if you want to live in an environment that's perpetually angry, then yeah, okay, then that's your that's your immortality. I don't consider it to be something nice or palatable, but anyways, if they do, then that's you know that's their that's their issue. Moving again. 
I'll have to fix it when uh, we get to the end of this, all, all these parts. So just bear with me for a bit. And I'll move, pull over and fix you. So that has to be done. There we go. We're, we're beyond most of the major bumps. And I'll come back and I'll, I'll fix you now. There we go. There we go. All fixed. So Hegel's con the thing is picks up on the nature of conflict, which is there for visually to get it. And this is what the Hegel does have that kid to see how the world is bathed in this. We're basically bathed in an angry world because all of our senses are full. Think for yourself, fend for yourself, live for yourself, make yourself happy. In other words, it's all about yourself. It's a selfish existence on the left. And that's that's what denotes the uh, left-hand path. Uh, the second thing that denotes a self-hand, a left-hand path uh, uh, existence is that it's it's uh, self. It's all about you. And this is what Lionel sort of see, but really can't sort of articulate. That we're living in a very selfish world, and this is by this is not, not here's the thing: by design is a bad term because it's not necessarily by design. Design is a loosely sort of configured thing where. Where people are free to partake of it in, in as much as they want to. So there are some who are more selfish than others, and you know others who are less selfish. And but it's almost impossible to become completely selfless. slowly put the uh, thermal cap on than before. This will be due to the rain and the slickness of it. So, won't be able to go as fast. Anyways, we're off. It's a wild blue yonder, well not exactly blue because it's uh, just about 22 hours into the seventh day. September.
being gingerly with the throttle, the accelerator, simply because of the amount of rain that's out. Oh, although it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but uh, still, anyways. With a wet road, you need to be cautious. Anyways, we are off. We will continue our discussion. Yeah, to a world that's, that's, that's quite puzzling, that there has a lot of facets to it. And in many, in many cases, things aren't always as they seem to appear. And what I'll sort of be demonstrating later on is how the so-called experts who put these scenarios together at Davos, it's very much like gaming. There is no fundamental difference between that and gaming. Uh, particularly in the nerd games where you develop scenarios to sort of move yourself along in a particular track or, or understanding. Uh, and this is sort of where I ended up leaving uh, Lord's Mobile in that uh, I had finished the simulation. I had gone as far as I can go. And this is what sort of made, had me made decisions before leaving other games. Uh, when one game that you're playing, the current game you're playing, becomes uh, too time consuming, other games have to fall off. And so the new game I'm playing is QR, uh, and that was taking an enormous amount of time. So, because it ended up winding into my research, uh, it was time to leave Lord's Mobile and focus on that. I've been off of Lord's Mobile now for a couple of uh, weeks. The fatigue is catching up on me. bit of a problem. When fatigue catches up with you, your sense of the ability to, to do different things so it sort of seems to be, well, a little difficult. And so what you end up doing is you end up, in a sense, uh, kind of shutting down. harder now as we head north. It is raining more. I put a temporary cover on the GoPro. Hopefully that will be sufficient. But I am going to get wet. <laughs> Even though I've got a hoodie on. To somewhat protect me, the hoodie at some point in time is going to get wet and the protection is going to end. I'm not going as fast as I could be going, but uh, then again, the road is a little slippery, so... Just like in the car, you, uh, when it's raining out and slippery out, you uh, go slower. This is the same thing. side of things. I myself am an Austin. Uh, of my particular definition, I am on the Eastern Christian side of Gnosis. And that is its own separate uh, little known thing. The 
Uh, I found this path, well, uh, sort of accidentally, uh, while doing a variety of different projects. And I was working with my dad on, on, on one. And I sort of thought that there had to be an Eastern Christian path, but I was never really too sure. But then my dad found references to it, uh, ironically enough, in the patron saint that we have as our church, patron saint. And I'll explain that uh, in another uh, sort of vlog an essay about the patron saints. Because patron saints can be either honorific or they can actually show up. You can experience their existence within the church. And I, I for one, have ex experienced the, the uh, uh, sort of connection. Things that occurred that was sort of... Well, you, you couldn't call it coincidental because it occurred way too often. And I'll explain this in, in this manner here. There was one a, bi one a bishop that came to our church, to our church, and it was my job to take the bishop around from point to point, particularly because it had been raining out. They was given an umbrella so that the bishop didn't get wet. Well, lo and behold, as we went from point to point to point, every time the car stopped, it was raining. It was raining the entire time, except for when the car stopped and it was time for me to get out to get the bishop the rain stopped. I got the bishop into the building without the need of the umbrella. It started raining again. This is repeated and he maybe maybe at 10 stops to do that day, 10, 10, 10 different places to visit. Every time throughout the entire day, it rained the entire day. But the only time it didn't rain is when the bishop was getting out to go from the car to the building and then from the building to the car. This is when it didn't rain. To so say that it was a coincidence, maybe once or twice it not raining when you go from car to building or building the car, that's a coincidence. When it happens repeatedly, that's no longer a coincidence. There's something else at play here. And this is what no see this is what even, even Carl Jung, what, what made Carl Jung so popular was this mysticism that was, with, particularly with uh, Lionel's following. It was this that was sort of uh, brought him to sort of some degree of fame. This is why Peter Jordan, uh, Jordanson, in many cases, idolizes uh, Jung. But Jung was, a, Jung was a student of four. He was initially an atheist. It wasn't until he really had his patient uh, line of falling that he began to believe in something more significant. Now it's raining harder. I'm going to have to change my clothes when I get to my place. That's alright. At least you're still going. <laughs> I'm going to have to put you in rice for a bit. Dry you off. Oh, uh, uh, uh. uh, at least the helmet is staying nice and clear in terms of the visor. Microcosm that I was talking about before, how these sort of intelligently believe the uh, the ones who put together the scenarios, and the policies for Davos and so on and so forth, they looked primarily at what's called the macrocosm, and they look at macroeconomics, so a number of things that sort of put them in line with the macro world and they ignore the microcosm but it's in the microcosm some of these details that really sort of you know cause a shift that that can that can be definitely unseen so you can't predict what's going to happen you can only sort of okay dude you get a nice car and so on and so forth but i don't care Oh, here 
go through nice and nice puddles here. I don't want to go bouncing through this section here in this in this rain. And it's more of the puddles on the ground than anything else. what happens the no seas occurs and, and more often than not from our perspective from the perspective of the general public in the microcosm this is why in many cases you'll call it as Lionel does they'll call it the shadow government whoever they are and in order, there is a sort of a rule of thumb that puts these people in such a mystic cate cat category that these are the people you don't mess with and so he really stays far away from the topic and just get calls on the shadow guard without actually going into some of the details that can be gotten into without causing any real sort of problems. And this is kind of where we sit right now uh, with our understanding. And so we will have to go further into Noses and make the connections of how the how Gnosis connects to both humanism and to the general geopolitics at large. And now we're getting it further and further into the game. The question is, as I said before, how do you deal with the different situations that are going on? It's up to you and how you decide what to do will determine success or failure in any case. 